Good morning again. This is Elsie. I'm glad that everybody is on and, of course, hoping and praying that everyone is staying healthy through this very much time of uncertainty that we have. So you have um, an advocate agenda in front. There are four bullet points, and we're going to discuss the uh, CARES stimulus package with Ken at this time. We're still unwrapping it, but Ken, you're on the phone. Sorry, I'm actually on the computer. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yep, sounds good here. So in the CARES Act, there are two sources of funding coming to Montana. The first is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, and that's eight million seven hundred and sixty five thousand dollars is an estimate that we received um, that goes to the governor and is to be used both for higher ed and k-12 and i believe it is up to the governor to decide how to divvy up that money in addition there's uh 41 million dollars 41 million two hundred ninety five thousand dollars that's coming through the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund and that's coming to the OPI to distribute to schools. And the only guidance we have that I've seen so far that's firm has came from a um, CCSSO webinar last week that referred for the ability of the, of the agency to set aside 10% um, for grants and emergency types of expenditures that are not done in it in that are up to the discretion of the agency. And, and the reference is that then 90% would be distributed to schools using Title I formulas. And I can tell you that that turns out to be a very complicated issue in terms of are we applying all of the Title I formulas that we do for Title I allocation now, or is this a simplified allocation? And we've been diligently trying to find the answer to that. What I can say as a, a to kind of give you a perspective on how this would work is that um, when we did the Title I allocation for this school year, we allocated about $45 million to schools. And if we assume, and this is a big assume, that we do hold back $10 million for discretionary spending. And um, that would leave about $37 million that would actually be distributed to schools through the Title I formulas. Uh, that's uh, about 82% of the allocations that we made this year. Um, so if, if we're a ballpark for a school district to estimate right now, that's one way to look at it but there's so much that needs to be answered. For example, in the current Title I um, allocations, we first set aside 7% for school improvement to targeted and comprehensive schools. Uh, are, are, are we supposed to use that formula for this new money? I wouldn't think so, but we really need to see the guidance on exactly how the Title I formulas will be applied. So that's what I know right now. Are there any questions about that? Ken, this is Diane Burke with MQEC. I was wondering if you had any time frames for that funding coming into the state and then um, in terms of distribution within the state. So the, the act uh, allows 30 days for the department, the education department to develop an application for states to use for applying for the funds. Although I believe the department has an expressed an intent to try and have that done within two weeks. And then another 30 days for the applications to be filed and then for awards to be made. And again, I would suspect that that's not going to take that long. Um, a good question will be that if we have this money and it's available, say 30 to 60 days from now, 
uh, and we can award it to schools, um, will schools want it at that time? Uh, or would they prefer to kind of use it next year? And in terms of actually awarding the money to the school, I don't think it will matter to us. We will award the money as soon as we practically can. And then it'll be a question of when the schools want to actually draw down the money and start using it. Thanks, Ken. This is Dylan. So, um, Diane, I appreciate the question. That's something that um, we've been working on and we'll hopefully have information coming out soon on what that timeline looks like. We want to get it um, out as soon as possible. We just don't want to put out inaccurate preliminary numbers. Um, and so at this time, I, uh, Will Parson with Senator Danes's office, I think is on the line. Will, is there anything that you want to add about these funding streams or about the project served grants that might be available to districts um, or any future future stimulus funding that might be coming? Yeah, hi folks. Um, I apologize, I had to hop on just a couple moments ago. So um, I just wanted to give you an update sort of on the, the uh, projected top line numbers uh, for Montana. Um, and uh, as um, mentioned before, waiting to hear some final numbers from the Department of Education, which should be forthcoming, um, I think this week uh, is the expectation. Um, our office worked with uh, the third party uh, to get a third party estimate from uh, the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service. And within, so within the Education Stabilization Fund, there are three different uh, sort of pockets of money. Uh, there's one, it's the, the Governor's Emergency Relief Fund. And the, their, um, their first look projection is that Montana should receive about 8.765 million. Um, and my understanding is that OPI would be distributing that. And that's, that's to be, that should go out to um, LEAs and higher ed institutions based on their, their COVID disruption. Um, so more to come on that. Um, the second element is the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. And their first projection um, is for about 41.295 million. Um, and that's, again, something that uh, if I understand correctly, that OPI would be distributing out to, uh, to LEAs uh, based on the most recent year's Title I-A grants. Um, the third element uh, has to do with Project Serve, which, as you may recall, uh, received an additional funding of $100 million uh, nationwide um, in the CARES Act that Congress passed last week. And for that, funding, um, each school district will apply, apply directly to the Department of Education. Um, so I, I know last week when we were on the call, um, one of our superintendents uh, asked about staffing and, and layoffs. Just wanted to raise a point that um, within the text of the CARES Act, there's a provision that says that uh, recipients of these stabilization funds um, are expected to continue paying employees and contractors to the greatest extent practicable during any period of disruptions or closures um, related to the coronavirus. So I hope that, hope that helps. And again, those are you know, first round numbers. Great. We should have more clarity as the week goes on. Thanks, Will. We appreciate that update. Um, and we did post information about the Project Serve grants on OPI's COVID-19 webpage too. And we'll be getting that that information out to schools so that they can apply directly. Um, I should ask too: Is there anyone else from the congressional offices on the line? Okay. If not, are there uh, any questions for Ken or Will? All right. So we'll jump into some um, age, some deadline reminders. Um, so we'll be, is this information posted on the COVID-19 webpage already or do we need to send it out? It'll be, it'll be posted shortly. Um, but some extensions, the House Bill 601 safety grants, um, uh, schools can submit a, an extension request um, 
those requests need to be in by June 30th. Uh, 21st century grantees, um, applications can extend out to June 1st. Um, stop grant reporting, um, it's due April 10th. And then uh, again on July 10th, um, accreditation uh, corrective plans need to be back by June 1st. Uh, Title IVA grants are due April 10th, which is a two-week extension. And school finance, there are currently no deadlines. Um, Nicole Thuat is working on school um, elections. And Perkins intent to, to apply, um, those are due by April 30th. Um, and then I think it, McCall wanted some time to talk about the school plans. Are you on the line, McCall? Yeah, I'm on. Um, yeah, I was just asked to provide a quick update and just wanted to let you all know that we did receive um, a plan from every school district, which is very exciting. Um, so all 400 um, have been received. I've looked through all of them. I had a meeting with the governor uh, yesterday afternoon. He uh, just went over some questions that he had He's going to have a call today with county and district superintendents at four, um, mostly just to touch base and talk through the plans, but then also to have conversations about um, the pupil instruction waivers. So that'll be today. Um, and I know I sent it to most of you on the call. Um, there is a max of 240 people that can be on. So just be thoughtful um, as you all um, jump on that call today. Thanks, McCall. Yeah, we were happy to see that every single district got those uh, plans turned around uh, so quickly. So that's great. Um, is there anything else uh, for the good of the order? Um, does anyone else on the phone call want to give an update? Hey, Dylan. Sorry, I forgot that Cheryl asked me to talk about um, some special ed um, examples from some of the plans. Did you guys still oh, sure. have some of that information? Yeah, go ahead. That'd be great. So it was pretty general. Um, I pulled eight random schools um, and kind of looked into their plans. Um, obviously, all of them are planning on providing uh, services to students with disabilities during these times. It will look a lot similar to what they're doing with um, other students who are getting remote learning services. Uh, mostly uh, schools have reached out um, and figured out what the best mode of delivery is, uh, whether that's through hard copies um, or if they have some kind of technology or broadband or Wi-Fi services that can be used. Um, of course, uh, staff and teachers are reaching out um, regularly to check in with the students. Um, they're conducting their IEP and 504 meetings through electronic means when um, available. And obviously sometimes they'll have to have these meetings um, in person, but they are of course saying that they're um, meeting all of the CDC state health uh, department guidelines in doing so. Um, oftentimes if there is a, a third party that works with these kinds of students, like for example, in Roundup, they work with the Central Montana Learning Cooperative, um, they're working with them just to make sure that they can reach out uh, to each student to provide services that are required. Um, and then of course, just working through that process. Um, and for the most part, um, all of them were working, you know, very similar to one another. Um, it was really great to see that schools put a lot of time and effort into thinking through what these processes look like, not just for all students, but those who might need a little extra help as well. And Cheryl did also ask me um, if they could have a copy of the plans. I'm uh, trying to figure out what that looks like and how I get that to her. Um, as you can imagine, most of the plans were six pages plus. Um, so rather than you know wasting a bunch of paper trying to figure out a Dropbox or some other method to get those to you guys. Thanks. 
Thanks, McCall. Um, you should be able to drop all those into a folder and then share it through the state EPAS system as long as it's working. <laughs> yeah, I'm, de I'm definitely not a pro at technology, so I will, I will find the next technology whiz to do that for me today. <laughs> okay, thanks, McCall. Um, yeah, any other updates from folks on the line? All right, well, we want to respect your time. Um, just to let you know, um, we will be sending out, like I said, more information this week as soon as we have it about um, these federal allocations to Montana. We have some information coming out today about assessments. Um, we're hoping to have another call with district um, and county superintendents later this week if we've got um, updates for them. And then our next call is scheduled for Thursday, correct? Oh, yeah, and I did want Tracy to talk about a unique situation we had come up uh, this morning, so I'll let her talk about that. Good morning, everyone. I want to just put this on your radar to be forward thinking about uh, something that could become a domino effect. We received notice from a school district that they are suspending food service as of next week. Uh, when we reached out to them to talk to them about why that was, they said their county health department has shut their building down completely and isn't allowing anybody in the building for the next 30 days. So they're, um, just a reminder that county health departments do have that authority over schools to completely close them in, in an event like this. Um, there were, our nutrition staff are working with them to try to figure out if there's any um, alternatives or ways we can continue to get food to families through shipping directly. So we are working on that, but I wanted to just put that on your radar because as the situation progresses, we may see more of this from County Health Department. Thanks, Tracy. So McCall, that's something to put on your radar. You might want to talk with Rafe about that. Um, it, it puts the school in a situation where they can't uh, follow the plans that they submitted to you in their entirety, um, but it's, it's out of their hands. It's out of their control if the county health department um, closes their buildings. So, does anyone have any thoughts on that? D Dylan, this is Diane. I was wondering if Tracy had any information what led to the county health department making that decision. Were there any criteria or had something occurred? Hi, Diane, this is Tracy. No, I don't know. Um, it, it's an evolving situation that we just became aware of. Our nutrition staff reached out to the, um, the school staff in that county and their response was that the county health department had shut them down. So we actually are in the process of reaching out to another school district in the same county to find out if they received similar direction to just make sure that that things are being um, taken care of consistently across counties with those county orders. And Diane, this is Elsie. I did reach out to a county commissioner in Fallon County last week, uh, and I can I can use my uh, same pathway to find out why why the commissioners have requested this of the health departments at this point. But as Tracy is saying, just as a heads up, you know there is broad authority here. Of course, the whole purpose is safety and the health and well-being of individuals in that building. But the domino effect, as Tracy mentioned, it not only could it go to other counties, but if teachers are not available in their classrooms for remote learning or gathering packets for any of the student population that they serve, um, it may put a challenge to the remote learning that uh, I believe has been working for the last two weeks. So. More, more attuned to that, and um, we'll we'll try to figure this thing out. Hopefully, it's an anomaly. Hopefully, it's something that we can uh, continue working through. Uh, this Thank is Lance. Um, we had uh, we had another county Department of Health that had imposed a fairly restrictive uh, isolation and quarantine protocol before the governor issued his statewide um, ruling yesterday. And I'm not suggesting that the governor should do this in any way, but if you look at the authority of the county departments of health, and it's actually the county board of health, as well as the county health officer, both have authority 
um, set forth in statute that allows them to set these kind of orders at a county level, if the governor felt that the uh, potential for a hodgepodge of different regulations at the county level were troublesome, he could actually waive uh, those, suspend those statutes so that the only uh, guidance would come at a state level from him. Um, the governor has shown some uh, respect, uh, which I think is just fine in his most recent uh, isolation order that said that he uh, suspends any, uh, or, or I'm sorry, suspends any county orders that are less restrictive than his own, but that uh, left open the possibility that counties could impose uh, more restrictive uh, limits pursuant to their authority. So again, I'm not suggesting that the governor should do anything. I'm just noting that the governor can pursuant to uh, you know, section 10-3-104 uh, subsection two uh, could suspend that authority if he felt that it were being uh, enforced in a way that made it difficult for schools to continue to comply with his directive. Thank you, Lance. Large state, large geographic area, and uh, different looks on local control. Okay, I think that concludes for the day. We are gonna be sending some other information that we had um, as well. So the division deadlines that will be on our website, we'll have that sent. And uh, possibly a summation of the moving target of the CARES stimulus dollars that uh, will be amending our school budget, hopefully shortly. And as more information flows, please all share. Um, one of the things I do know, we have rural schools on the phone. And in my mind, in talking to the secretary, that has been my most uh, poignant discussion with her, is making sure that equity uh, does flow to our most rural schools, where there is, uh, can be more opportunity given through any, any part of federal relaxing of regulation, or anything dealing with the, the new care stimulus. So with that, thank you all. Uh, please stay healthy. We will have another call at the same time on Thursday. And McCall, I appreciate um, your sharing about the plans. And um, we're looking forward to that conversation this afternoon. Thank you so much, all. Stay healthy.